Seeing mixed race children among the black slave children, white women felt confused. They knew that the children of the black male and female slaves they owned had to be black. However, who were those mixed race children that were a bit fair in complexion? That's when they came to know about the sexual relationships their white husbands had engaged in with black female slaves. Using threat and fear, their white husbands would use black women slaves as properties they could do anything with. Yet they did not know that their white wives were thinking of doing the same to punish their husbands. Because white women owned slaves, mostly of whom were black men, they thought about something nasty. So what horrific and nasty acts would white women engage in that embarrass white men to this day? Let's know about that in this video. The Black History Archives Interestingly, you would find few accounts detailing white women in slavery. That's because this has been intentionally done to avoid the embarrassment that haunts white men to this day. White women actively participated in the slave economy rather than merely observing from the sidelines. They were involved in buying, selling, and owning slaves, with around 40% of slave owners being white women. The more slaves a woman owned, the more influence and authority she wielded. Therefore, often, parents passed down more slaves than land to their daughters, linking slave ownership closely with the identity of white Southern women. That's because after marriage, land would go to their husbands, but slaves were often kept by the women. Before the Civil War, American white women faced considerable restrictions on their freedoms. Denied the right to vote, they were effectively absorbed into their husband's authority upon marriage, essentially becoming their husband's property. Their mobility and freedom were severely restricted, often using abuse as a means of control. Despite enduring mistreatment and infidelity, women were expected to maintain a cheerful, obedient, and loyal demeanor. For white women, slavery offered a sense of power and autonomy. Many actively participated in the slave trade, owning multiple slaves to maintain their social standing. Legal battles were fought to retain ownership of slaves, with many white women prevailing in court due to the belief that slavery equated to freedom. While historians previously downplayed the role of white women in slavery, Recent research has provided a more detailed understanding. Accounts collected through initiatives like the Federal Writers Project shed light on the lived experiences of black individuals. These narratives revealed that white girls were indoctrinated from an early age in the practices of controlling and owning enslaved people. This deeply ingrained mindset perpetuated the cycle of slavery across successive generations. In the antebellum South, Many young women learned about societal norms and life from their close family members, including female relatives like cousins, friends, mothers, and grandmothers. They understood that upon acquiring property, it would typically transfer to their husbands upon marriage unless they took proactive steps to retain control. Thus, these young girls were taught the importance of safeguarding their wealth regardless of their future husband's capabilities. As white women reached maturity and became eligible to own slaves, their elevated social status granted them significant authority over these individuals. This enabled them to exert control over the lives of those they owned, sometimes resorting to verbal or physical exploitation. Southern households aimed to simulate the hierarchical structure of slave society, desiring to acquire more servants at reduced costs. Growing up during this era, white girls witnessed their parents exerting control over their black slaves and learned to mimic their behavior. They were taught to adopt a strategic and calculated approach, fully understanding the consequences of their actions. Accounts from historical sources like They Were Her Property vividly depict life during that time. For example, the book recounts instances such as Lizzie Anna Burwell, a three-year-old who demanded her father harm a black slave and obtain new maids for her. Fathers often bestowed additional slaves upon their daughters, effectively transferring ownership to them. Here's a reminder to please support us so we can make more videos for you by subscribing to our channel and giving the video a like. We want to build a strong community and we need your support. Let's continue now. Legally, married women were not recognized as property owners due to the coverture doctrine, which merged the legal identity of married couples under the husband's authority. However, despite women's limited legal and political standing, they employed various strategies to assert control over property, 
including prenuptial agreements that occurred before marriages and legal instruments like deeds of trust and gifts. In Louisiana, women could establish separate marital estates if their husbands displayed improved financial management. In essence, the antebellum South operated under two concurrent systems, a patriarchal structure and a framework granting white women legal and financial influence. Despite the limitations imposed by coverture, Southern families found ways to bypass or ignore them, enabling women to wield power over property and consequently over their black slaves. During the 19th century, there was a prevalent misconception regarding white women, painting them as delicate and sheltered individuals confined to the home, shielded from the harsh realities of the world outside. However, historical evidence from diverse sources denies this notion, revealing the active involvement of white women in the slave markets of that era. Despite the prevalence of slavery, women took part in buying and selling black slaves, often arranging transactions within their local social circles from the comfort of their own homes. Due to their significant influence, white women played a crucial role in shaping a distinct market for enslaved wet nurses. Some felt compelled to separate black women from their families to care for their own children. Reports suggest that white women, particularly those who had frequent childbirth, saw enslaved black women as a solution to ease their domestic burdens. Depending on their financial status, white women had the flexibility to hire, borrow, or purchase enslaved wet nurses allowing them the freedom to socialize while others tended to their newborns. Unfortunately, not all white women treated their enslaved individuals with compassion. Some exhibited extreme brutality, necessitating intervention from their husbands. Wealthy white women often invested in enslaved men and women to exploit them for reproduction, thereby increasing their slave population. Historical records document instances where white women would force black male slaves into sexual relations. Although the nature of these relationships varied, they typically involved coercion, manipulation, and the inherent power imbalances inherent in the master-slave dynamic. Some white women slave owners engaged in sexual relationships with their black male slaves to assert dominance and control. They used their position as slave owners to pressure or force the slaves into sexual encounters, exploiting their vulnerability and lack of autonomy. These relationships were often non-consensual and driven by the white women's desire for power and personal satisfaction. But here, something should be paid attention to. During slavery, black slaves were not considered humans and therefore, they were not allowed to come near or touch their white masters. The contempt was too much. However, interestingly, white women would ignore this contempt because of their sexual desires. Black male slaves were not only allowed to come near but touch and engage sexually with white women, showing a whole different side. Some white women slave owners pursued sexual relationships with black male slaves to fulfill their own desires or seek companionship. While there may have been instances of genuine affection or emotional attachment, these relationships were fundamentally unequal, shaped by the racial hierarchies of the time. The nature of these relationships led to various activities depending on the circumstances. Some encounters took place secretly, concealed from public view due to the societal taboo surrounding interracial relationships. Secret rooms existed where white women would go and call black male slaves to give them the treatment. However, in other cases, these relationships were more overt, with white women openly taking black male slaves as sexual partners or even engaging in long-term romantic involvement with them. Regardless of the specifics, it's crucial to acknowledge that these relationships were deeply rooted in the exploitation and dehumanization inherent in the institution of slavery. They exemplify the broader system of oppression that allowed white slave owners to dominate the bodies and lives of black individuals, perpetuating a legacy of trauma and injustice that continues to impact society today. Sexual exploitation represented a harrowing aspect of the abuse endured by black male slaves, frequently inflicted by affluent white women. Despite the prevailing notion portraying white women as passive or innocent, instances existed where they actively coerced black male slaves into non-consensual sexual encounters, exploiting their authority and dominance. This reprehensible conduct perpetuated a vicious cycle of sexual violence and degradation, further dehumanizing the already oppressed. Harriet Jacobs' autobiography, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, 
provides a stark example of such exploitation, detailing how daughters of plantation owners exploited vulnerable black male slaves under their control for sexual gratification. Jacob's account underscores the predatory nature of such behavior, which cannot be construed as consensual but rather as sexual abuse. It underscores the pervasive sexual control wielded by plantation mistresses and elite white women, mirroring the actions of their male counterparts. Additionally, white women employed threats of false accusations of rape to assert dominance over slaves and enforce compliance with their desires. Various factors may have motivated such sexual exploitation, ranging from boredom or sexual frustration to an unconscious attempt to compensate for their lack of agency in other aspects of their lives. Considered the property of their husbands, plantation-class women face significant constraints on their sexual autonomy compared to men. Exploiting slaves sexually may have provided them with a semblance of power and control in a society where they lacked agency. The lives of plantation mistresses were often marked by loneliness, sadness, and limited freedom. Married at a young age and left to fend for themselves on plantations while their husbands were away, they grappled with isolation and sought ways to exert control over their constrained lives. Moreover, the expectation of remaining obedient despite their husbands' infidelities with female slaves compounded their suffering. In essence, Southern women were prisoners in disguise, trapped by societal norms and patriarchal structures that relegated them to subordinate roles. Establishing sexual relationships with strong black male slaves allowed them to enjoy their lives and punish their husbands silently. After the Civil War ended, many white women sought to retain control over labor conditions by negotiating with newly liberated black individuals. One strategy they employed involved taking the children of these young African Americans as apprentices. While apprenticeship was seen as an improvement over outright slavery, it still fell short of offering genuine freedom. Former slaves often found themselves working under the same master or mistress as before, typically earning meager wages and enduring a predetermined period of service. Many apprentices ended up serving the same individuals who had previously owned them, resulting in minimal improvements to their overall quality of life. What do you think? Why white women used to do nasty things with their black male slaves? Was it to feel a sense of authority or have better sexual lives because their white husbands often lacked what black male slaves had? In the comments section right below, share your thoughts on whether similar practices with minor differences exist today. Would you like us to make more videos? If yes, please support us by subscribing to the Black History Archives and clicking the bell icon. You can check out more videos on our channel too.